has been a professor in this department since 2005. Uh, before that, she did her, her undergraduate work at Harvard. She got her doctorate at, at Stanford working on two-dimensional superconductors. And that maybe start, started, the, uh, started her off working in low-dimensional systems and tiny-scale electronic systems. She was then a, a junior fellow at, at Harvard uh, working on uh, carbon nanotubes and, again, uh, uh, sort of nanostructured superconductors. And uh, she's won many, many awards over the years. So she got an NSF Career Award to support her, her research as a new faculty member here at Illinois. Uh, she was an emerging scholar uh, named by the Diverse, uh, Diversity Magazine. Uh, she won a Dean's Award for Excellence in Research. She won the Denise Denton uh, Emerging Leader Award. She was named a fellow of, uh, in the Center for Advanced Studies, so CAS on campus. She won the Maria Gopert Meyer Award from the APS, so really distinguished or uh, a high honor for sort of uh, mid-career faculty members in science. Um, and she's recently been named uh, a member of the Defense Sciences Study Group, so DSSG, uh, which is a really uh, high uh, prestige and important role in sort of uh, developing uh, defense sciences within the US. And, and recently, she's really led the effort to bring a MRSEC, or Materials Research Center uh, for Science and Engineering, back to, to campus. And she'll be the director of that, or she is the director of that now, as it's, as it's just starting up. And so she'll be telling us today about uh, physics at the nanoscale and sort of related to work done in her, uh, her own group on low-dimensional systems and, and low-dimensional superconductors. So. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a really great pleasure to be here today. I think the last time I gave one of these talks, I was seven months pregnant with my second daughter about 10 years ago. So, um, so it's nice to be back again. Um, and today I'm going to talk about, uh, about electronics and why we can or cannot make them smaller. So electronics and nanoelectronics. Um, and, and basically, when we talk about nanoelectronics or nanoelectronics research, right, it's a very broad term. You hear it thrown around a lot. And so um, for, for me, thinking about research, I really think about maybe four different main things for nanoelectronics. And I've just listed them here as blurbs. So when we talk about nanoelectronics, we talk about making existing electronic elements smaller. So just taking what we have and scaling it down so we can get smaller iPhones and things like that. Um, but then also using new types of nanoscale materials and seeing what their electronic properties are. Beyond that, we're interested in just understanding the basic physics of small structures. When things get very small, their properties change. Things like quantum mechanics become relevant. So what happens in those cases when you make things at the near atomic scale? And then finally, we think about when properties appear in very small nanoscale materials like quantum properties, can we utilize these properties and do things beyond what we do with conventional electronics? And so, so that's the... Um, <laughs> So that's, the, that's really the outline of my talk today. Well, I'll first talk about sort of the history and progress in just making things smaller, from the first enormous room-sized computers down to what we have today. Um, I'll then talk about, different, one, about how we use new types of nanoscale materials, especially focusing on graphene, which is a material that we use a lot and study a lot in my lab. Um, and then in, in that context, I'll talk about how we study these materials and try to understand their basic physical properties, which are often different from what you'd see in larger materials. And finally, I'll touch on, on using behavior beyond conventional electronics and, um, and quantum computers. And, and feel free to ask questions during the talk, because this is really supposed to be understandable. And so it's not, I should know, you should ask questions, right? <laughs> Otherwise, we're all wasting our time. It's early morning. We'd be out in that cold and rainy day, right? Okay, so why do we care about nanoelectronics? Well, electronics are everywhere, right? Every, everything we do, our, our lives are saturated with, with electronic materials, with electronics. Um, you know, in, in, our, in our homes, we have every, every device that we have from our refrigerators to dishwashers have electron, are electronically controlled. Our cars are controlled. There's electronics that we can see all the time. And then all of the electronics that we can see are run by very small electronics that we can't even see. And so everywhere we go, from our watches to, to our to our refrigerators um, is full of electronics. And, and you might say, okay, you know, things like, you know, this computer is, it's not really nano. I mean, it's smaller than it used to be, but it's not nano, it's a foot long, right? So when we talk about nanoelectronics, what we really mean are the big electronics, like a computer or a refrigerator, are run by the little electronics, like the big fish, small fish, and doctors. They're not really eating each other, but they, but, they're, uh, <laughs> but the big ones have small ones inside. So if you, if you crack open a computer, you'll see that what runs it, what, what, what does all the operations in the computer is the motherboard, 
And then the thing that powers the motherboard is another smaller element called the microprocessor. This is the CPU where all the processing is done. And then this CPU is run by billions of transistors. And these transistors are really at the nanoscale, between 10 and 50 nanometers these days. And these are the on-off of the computer bit. So every big electronic piece that you have at the end of the day is run by these tiny, tiny little things that do all the calculations that you need to run these big computers. And that's why we talk about nanoelectronics, because, because everything that we deal with these days at the end of the day is run by these very small nanoscale objects. Okay, and so a lot of research, especially research that, that we do as, 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 as physicists and material scientists, we deal with electronics, um, deals with trying to improve these very small basic elements. Because if we understand and can improve these elements, then we can build up to make smaller, better, faster computers. It's like the, the athlete of computers. <laughs> faster, better, stronger. Okay, so, so we throw out a lot of terms. We're just talking generally about electronics. And we think of electronics as computers and phones and things like that. But I'm talking about from a research perspective. So from a research perspective, what do we mean and how do we study electronics? Okay. So the very basic idea of electronics is that we're studying how electrons flow through materials. Materials have particles called electrons in them. Um, you put a, a voltage across them, the electrons will flow. And we just study how these electrons flow. And so here's a very basic, um, I stole this from my kids, it's snap circuits. I don't know if anyone out there has this, but let's see, I haven't done this in a while. Video. Okay, there we go. So I, I love these things. Has anyone, has, any, has anyone ever used snap circuits before? I know, I love these. Right. And the kids will get mad because they're always like, don't touch it, you're going to break it. <laughs> because, you know what I mean? like, like, no, I do this professionally, and then I break it and I feel bad. So, okay, so, <laughs> so this is, right. so, so here we have snap circuits, and this is your basic electronic circuit. There's a battery. The batteries produce electrons. They use chemistry to produce an excess of electrons. And the electrons flow around this circuit. And here I've just put a switch in. And these are just metals. These are just metals that snap in. And here's a fan that runs. And so if I turn this on, nothing happens. And if you can see from the circuit, can anyone see why nothing may happen? So here's my circuit going around. What's missing from this circuit? There's a piece missing, right? So for your basic circuit, you have to have electrons flow all the way around in a loop. And that's what powers the circuit, the flow of electrons around the loop. So if I add another little snappy piece in here. I snap that in, and then I turn it on. Now my fan goes, okay? So that's the basic idea behind electronics. I just have a battery or some way for source of electrons, and they flow around the circuit. As they flow past devices, they can run those devices and make them go. And with that same flow of electrons, I can run different things. So this was a, a fan, and I can take out the fan, and I can put in a light for example, I just snap that in, and now I can snap all pieces together in my circuit and flip the switch. Oh wait, that's not a light. Oh, that's something else. Wait, hold on. The light's in here somewhere. This is why they don't want me messing with it. Because I don't know what all the elements are. It's totally in here. There's all these cool things. Where's the light? Uh... <laughs> oh wait, here it is. Aha, I found it. Okay, that's the... <laughs> It has some weird, it's a deep, okay, here it is. So the light, so I really hope this works. Okay, now I can snap this in, and I turn it on, and aha, the light turns on. <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> right. but, but you can see that when you have an electrical circuit, you can now do different things with it, right? So all you need is that electrical current flowing around in the circle, and you put different elements in, and they can run in different ways. And that's really the basics behind electronics. You use this electricity to run to power different things. They can run your, your microprocessors, they can run your fans, they can even run your lights if you get the right element. Okay, so, so that's what we do for, 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 for running, for studying and, and, and utilizing electronics. So when we do experiments in the lab, what we're really studying a lot of the time is different materials and different configurations of circuits and how they conduct electricity. How does the electricity go through them? Does it, can we modify it in some way? Can we turn it on and off using materials that act like different sorts of switches? Um, and we study how, you know, how well they conduct electricity and what their resistance to electron flow. So we talk about things like resistance, that just means that they're not conducting electricity 
well. So it's the inverse of conduction. So often, you know, you see at home, you have something you call a fluke, and you can just put that with two probes onto something like a resistor and measure how well it conducts electricity. Okay? And again, if you might see something like the basic circuit, this is just what I showed you here. It's just a model of a circuit where we have a current going through some element that we write as a model here. I've written a resistor. The resistor can be anything. It can be a light. It can be a fan, something that the electricity goes through, right? And it's powered by a battery. And often we have something called Ohm's law, which tells us the relationship between the applied current and the battery voltage that we have on there. And that's just what we use to try to understand how the materials are reacting. And, and just to note, there are lots of different types of electronic elements. There are things like inductors and transistors. So let me see what happens here. So here I have just, just some other elements. Today I'm going to talk a lot about transistors, but I just want to note that there are things called um, inductors, which are basically just loops. You can see that here. You can see it here more easily. It's just a loop, a coil, right? And actually putting a coil in the circuit, having, having a current go around the coil in, at a certain, you know, depending on how fast it goes around the coil, it actually affects the current, okay? Or we have something called a capacitor, which is really just um, double plates, plates where you have electrons go on one plate and come off the other plate, and changing how much area is between these two plates also affects the current in different ways. There are different ways that we can affect the current. Here's just a little example of that. I don't know where this is. <laughs> I'm going to be guessing. I think it may not be on here. I don't know if that was a guess. Okay, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> seven. Who out here knows? Do you know which one this is? Yeah, I don't see it on here. It doesn't have one. Oh, it's just, oh, that makes a lot of sense. It doesn't have one. That's good. Okay, so I didn't mess up. Um, Okay, so here's just a circuit that has um, a capacitor bank and an inductor. Here's just my inductor here. This is my capacitor bank, and as I turn it on, right, and then I turn on the capacitors, you can see the light getting brighter as I increase the number of capacitors, and as I increase them further, the light gets dimmer again. Now, I don't want to go through the science behind this. I'm going to talk about something else mostly today, but just, just to show you that different elements can control how much current goes through, and how you affect the resistance and behavior of objects. And even when I have capacitors, I can then take this inductor, and this is a, a, an iron rod through it, which changes its properties. And as I move this rod in and out, I can also affect the current going through the circuit. So this is just to show that there's lots of different elements and ways to affect the current going through the circuit. This is the sort of thing we study in electronics. We try to make all of these elements smaller. All of these are on a computer chip. But I'm going to focus today on transistors because those are really the um, basic on-off element of the computer chip, but they also have these other things, too. Okay, so from a research point of view, again, we're looking at these materials and we're trying to study the resistance and trying to both understand and utilize, yes, Yes. Yeah. In the body, you mean? Okay, I mean, I, I can say more about this at the end, it's a little off topic, but, but the question is, if, if your body has electrical currents in it, and how do, you, how do you make sure that the currents going through one thing aren't affecting the currents in another? And, and basically, a body is very much like your computer in some sense, right? So you have, in your computer, you have electrical circuits running in all different areas through different transistors at the same time, and you design the circuits so that they don't interfere with each other. Um, and, you know, so we've been designing computers over the past 60 years or something, and our bodies have been designed over the past 
millions of years, and so and and they you know and their and their entrance on our bodies are designed much better, and so our our bodies are designed as circuits not to interfere with each other in a very similar way. I can say that for now. Yeah. Okay. So from research point of view, when we're looking at electronics, right, we want to really understand and use these changes in conductance or resistance for. For, for some application or really just understand what's happening. So if I take a basic circuit like this, I said this is our battery, and then we're putting a current through it, and we're putting a current over some object, let's just call it a resistor, it could be a light, it could be anything, a detector. And let's say I do something to this resistor, like I add molecules to it, okay? So a resistor is maybe, anything has resistance, any material, let's just call it a piece of metal, okay? So I'm measuring the resistance or conductance through this piece of metal, and then I add molecules to it, and the resistance changes. And so that is a sensor already, okay? So that's actually how we start making devices and utilizing them and understanding them. If things like, the, if the properties like the resistance change and you put in molecules, you can suddenly sense things like detect different sorts of gases in the air, okay? Or let's say in this case, I take another circuit and I add a electric field. I put another metal on it and add another battery to that and this electric field then changes this resistance, okay? And let's say the electric field changes the resistance. The resistance becomes extremely large. Right? So the resistance goes from something small to something large. That's like going from on to off in a device, and we call that a transistor. That's a field effect transistor, actually, just using electric field to turn something on and off. And so these are sort of devices that we study and make and try to optimize. Okay, so that's how we study electronics. The next question is, well, why are we making them nano? Well, we've already touched on this, because everything is getting smaller. We want smaller phones and computers. We want we want uh, you know, drugs that can run through our veins and target cancers or diseases. We want little flies that spy on us everywhere. We want cars, okay, you're right. We, we don't want the little flies, but they exist, okay? <laughs> and, and maybe, okay, they only spy on our kids when they're doing no good, not on us, they're controlled. And uh, we want nano cars. We want, we want nano everything. So if we want smaller sensors and smaller computers, we've gotta make smaller electronic devices. And so I'm just gonna start by talking a little bit about how we've gotten to smaller computers as an example of this. Okay, so I don't know if anyone's ever seen the first computer or a picture of it. Okay, this is actually a mechanical device. It was, it was uh, made in 1832 by Charles Babbage in, in Cambridge. Um, this is 11 feet long and weighs five tons, and it works by a hand crank. And so what it does, it has columns of different mechanical registers, and each column represents, say, a number in a polynomial, like x and x squared or x cubed. And then by figuring out the differences between the numbers, you can actually calculate you know, what the values of the polynomials are, for example. And so this thing was actually accurate to like 31 digits. And, and if you ever wanna feel um, kind of lame, just go back and start reading what people have done hundreds of years ago, in a sense. It took me a long time to even figure out what this was, right? And this is, yeah, these people are just you know, figuring out how to do math and calculations using these mechanical devices, yeah. I'm sorry, what? That I don't know. It was a, was it a, was did she finish a mechanical? I think yes. Ada Lovelace at some point did finish a mechanical computer. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Exactly. Um, right. So 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 this was this was a it was a computing device. Okay, but it was mechanical and you had to crank it to get things to work. Okay, and so it took you know a, many more years to get to the first electronic computer. This was made in 1946. It was called the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, the ENIAC. And in this case, they used electronic charges rather than mechanical registers to store numbers, if that makes sense. So before you just had a mechanical thing on a, you know, on a wheel telling you where the numbers were, and now you have electronic charges that are either on or off, which can store numbers for you. So this was really one of the first general electronic computers. And it stored these numbers in, in vacuum tubes. I can show you a vacuum tube over here. So, so maybe you can see this person here, but you can see this is a this is a vacuum tube. Can you guys see that? Here's a vacuum tube. And so a vacuum tube is just it has electrons that can go from one side of the tube to the other. It puts a voltage across it, and it's it's kind of like a light bulb basically. It just boils off electrons, okay, from one side to the other. And there's a grid that controls it, so you either get electrons flowing or you don't get electrons flowing, and that's your on-off of your bit for a vacuum tube computer. And these were the first these were the first electronic 
computing devices. Um, and again, you know, in order to get this to, this can actually calculate a lot. It could actually perform, you know, 5,000 operations per second. So it could do something much faster than a person could do. But to give you, you know, to give you a, a comparison, we're now at the, you know, the billions of operations per second in computers. But back in the day, that was very, very impressive. Um, but it was big. It took up a whole room, an 80-foot room. It weighed 30 tons. Um, it consumed 150 kilowatts of power. So this was in, in Pennsylvania, and there was a rumor that every time you turned on this computer, the power in the lights in all of Philadelphia would dim. <laughs> so it took so much power to run. I don't know if that actually happened or not, but you know, it took that much. And it crashed every, every two days, it would go down. <laughs> so long as it ever ran without crashing was five days. It's because these tubes would just blow out all the time. But it worked, right? It, was a, it, was a, it could hold memory, and it was a really a huge, a huge um, step in terms of doing computations. Okay. And then came John Bardeen. Okay. So John Bardeen was a professor here for many, many years in, in the physics department um, and electrical engineering. Um, but when he was at at and Bell Labs, along with Shockley and Bertain, um, they were actually, again, just researching the fundamental properties of materials. They were trying to make an amplifier for a radio, right? And in the process of doing that, they invented this device, which is a solid state device, which could amplify current and turn it on and off. And this was the first transistor. Um, now, the first transistor was very big, but because it's made of a solid material, it could be made tiny. Unlike a vacuum tube that you have to have a current flowing in a vacuum, in this case, it's a material which means it can be scaled down. And that's part of why this was really revolutionary. Okay? So this is just a switch. I've made a little diagram of this here. Um, the way it works is it has, it has two different materials. They're called semiconductors. And one side, on either end, you have an excess of electrons. In the middle, you have a lack of electrons. I call it positive because there's a lack of electrons, and no current can flow from one side to the other because there's not enough electrons that can pass through here to get to the other side. So that's your off state of the transistor. Okay? But then when you put a little current into this middle part, you apply a small current so that, so that you get just enough electrons in this middle part, suddenly a huge current can flow from left to right. And so this is a very revolutionary device because applying a very small current to it can create a much larger current across it. So you can turn it on and off at low power in a solid state device, and then you can do logic where on is a zero and off is a one. And so, and so, the, uh, so the transistor really, really changed uh, technology. Okay? And so smaller devices these days mean, mean smaller transistors. And this is just to show you, give you an example of where we are now today. If you look at a circuit, at a motherboard, at a processor, you'll see it's actually a 3D integrated circuit where it's not just one transistor going across, it's actually patterned in all dimensions where this is metal going down to contact, and then these are tiny transistors patterned at the bottom, and these days they look like this. They're about 50, smaller than 50 nanometers. You can almost not tell that it's the same thing, but if you look carefully, you can see there's a gate on top, and the current has to flow from side to side. So it's really the same sort of device, just made really small with years and years of research. Okay. So you've probably heard of Gordon Moore's law. Gordon Moore was the head of Intel for many years, and he found that the transistor size tends to half every 18 months. Because this is the great thing about, about really solid materials. Once you figure out how to the principle of this thing, then you then it's a materials question and then the physics question of just making it smaller and smaller. And so the size of transistors, you can see here, this is our, our evolution of technology board. So these are our vacuum tubes, 1930, 1940, 1950. You can see that these have gotten smaller, right? So vacuum tubes are smaller. This is, let's see, to get a sense of scale, like these are thumb sized, okay? But it's hard to make them smaller than that because you really have to accelerate electrons through a vacuum from one side to the other. And then from 1950 to 1960, there's an enormous jump when you get down to the transistor. So suddenly you go from this side op size object to this size object. Right, in 1970, they get even smaller. And as you can't see this, this is actually a chip that has you know, dozens or hundreds of transistors on it. And you can actually see this is a, you know, this is a, um, a core memory from 1967. Okay, you can probably, you can, these are great. You can, you can see all the elements on here. <laughs> you see all these little things on here. These are the elements from a core memory. It's, it's two kilobytes. I'm breaking it. I'm break. um, it's, it's two kilobytes. Um, and you can compare it to what you have today, where you have a motherboard, which is, terabytes. Okay, so you have, you know, millions of times more, more processing power today than you had in 1967, but if this were made in the 1940s, this would take up this room. 
Okay, so you can see where we've gone in terms of making elements smaller, right? This is this was really state of the art, and then all of these elements have progressively gotten smaller and smaller and smaller over the years. Okay, so so here's here is the here's the transistor. This is a, a bank of transistors in in the 90s, and 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 you can see here if you can compare the sizes here. This is the the size of a transistor per year. I'm sorry, you can't really see this, but this is 1980 to I can't even see it. What is the year on there? Up to 2010 is the last one. That's really weird. That I, okay, I don't know why it's like that. But up to 2010, but you can see that in in uh, in 19, 1970, uh, transistors were about the size of a human blood cell, right? They're about 10 microns, right? They got down to the size of a human. You know, that, that's of the order, to give you a sense of scale, a human hair is about 60 micrometers, okay? Six, six times 10, 60 times 10 to the minus five meters, right? So they're about the size of a little bit bigger than a hair over here. And now they've gone down below the size of a virus, okay? So here's an Ebola virus, and, uh, and here's a transistor. Okay? And, and that, that's amazing when you think about it, right? So we think of cells in our bodies as small, and yet the electronic elements that we use and take advantage of all the time, right? The things that that we just you know, we, we just assume is always there has billions of objects that are running it that are smaller than the size of a virus, okay? and someone engineered that. And so, corresponding to you know the reason we want to keep making transistors smaller is that it allows us to put more and more of them on a computer chip. Okay, so again, this is a related plot where you can see the number of transistors per chip. In 1970, there were 4,000, 4,004 on the chip, okay? Whereas by 2005, there were, I don't know, let's see, million, billion, right? <laughs> there are a billion on a chip, okay? Today, we're at the stage where transistors are about 14 nanometers in size, right? And there are 30 billion on each processor, 30 billion of these, okay? And you want to pack them in, so they're packed into a small size. The reason your computers are actually bigger than that little tiny chip is that these things get very hot. So you need things like fans, and they need things like some of these capacitors and inductors, which are still kind of big, and you need screens and other things. But the processor itself is extremely tiny, right, with a ton of power in a small area, which is what allows us to keep making things like this. Okay, okay so, you know, a lot of industry and people think that in order to keep technology moving forward, we have to, we have to stay along this, this Moore's Law plot, right? If we, if we fall off here somehow, the entire economy across the world is going to, going to fall apart. Um, you know, it'll, I'm sure it'll, it'll fall apart for different reasons before that, but, but <laughs> regardless, you know, there's a lot of incentive to stay along this Moore's Law path, okay? So, so that's good. On the other hand, it's a hard thing to do. How can, can you keep making things smaller and smaller? What are the limits to making things smaller? And it turns out that we're reaching fundamental physical limits of shrinking electronics. And this is because of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics prevents us from fully turning off a transistor that's too small. So let me explain that a little bit. So first we'll look at an example here of how we can turn on and off a transistor. This is a different type of transistor. It's what we call the field effect, but it's a very similar idea. You have different electric, electric gates, you put electric fields across here, and as you put electric fields across, you turn this from zero to positive voltage, the electrons move across and you get current flowing across the device, okay? So this region, you want these regions to be, to be controlled, to be able to go off when you put a voltage on them so you can turn it off and then you can turn it on again, okay? But what would happen if this region of zero voltage, this region right here, is so narrow that long electrons can extend through it even when it's in its off state. Okay, now that's a really weird statement, because what do you mean by a long electron, right? It doesn't make any sense. Electrons are tiny particles. And so when we talk about long electrons, it's hard to think of, you know, we know that they're just little single particles. But on the other hand, what quantum mechanics tells us is that electrons are also waves, okay? So this is one of the crazy things about quantum mechanics, that everything is both a particle and a wave. And this is something that de Broglie um, really articulated in 1924, that all matter is both a particle and a wave. So electrons are tiny particles that you can hit things in, hit things with, that you can see currents flowing across, right? They can go around in a loop, but they also have a wave-like nature where they can interfere and do things, right? So electrons are a wave, um, you know, this pointer has a wave function associated with it. All of you have wave functions associated with you. You're both particles and waves, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, I got a wave. <laughs> right? That's right. We have all different sorts of waves that you can do. Right? <laughs> but, you know, we're so big. If you're, if you're really big and, and heavy, and I don't mean that badly, we're all heavy compared to an electron, then our wave functions are really, really, really tiny. Our wave functions are like 10 to the minus 36 meters. So we never actually see our own wave functions. We can't really interfere it or play with it. But electrons are much smaller than us, and so you can actually interfere electrons. So when you think of waves, you think of something like water. If you ever take you know, a sink and you just poke your finger in, you notice that you get circles coming out around it. Those are the waves in water spreading out. And if you put two fingers in, those waves interfere with each other. And so a way of deter determining whether something is a wave or not is just by watching it interfere and saying, okay, if something interferes with itself, then it has to be a wave, right? Okay. So, and so it was shown that electrons can actually interfere with each other. And we have a little demo here where we can where we show that. Let's do that. So, so what I have over here is, and I might need to turn the lights off, I'll show you first. Uh, this is a, uh, a power supply. That's not the exciting part. Um, and then there's a tube here, which is, which is very similar to a vacuum tube. It just puts a voltage on one side and electrons flow to the other, and then you have a phosphorescent screen where the electrons glow on the other side. And there's a black thing in the middle because I don't want you to see the central electrons coming through, but I want you to see what happens when we put a grid on the inside. So what we've done is put some slits in there that the electrons can bend through, right? So if they're just particles, you just get one line coming through, but if they're waves, then they bend around this slit and should form rings, like putting your finger into water. So, this up first. As you can see it blowing. And it might be a little hard to see on here, but we'll turn off the lights. We see the, I, I, can you see the rings here on the actual thing? Anyone who's close enough? Okay, it's hard to see it on the. I'll turn it down. Can you see it? Okay, you can't see it on the overhead, but you can totally see it on there. <laughs> who can see? Who can? Who can see it on the on the actual demo itself? Okay, you guys over there need to believe these people over here. <laughs> So, so it's just a little bright here, but if you, uh, but if you, but if you look at it, you can actually see that there are light and dark rings forming there from the electrons actually bending, bending through uh, this grid, which is a way of proving that electrons are in fact, um, are in fact waves as well as as particles. So electrons are waves as well as particles. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that they have some extended wavelength. So even if we turn off a transistor, an electron wave can continue through to the other side if it's you have a thin enough barrier, right? Um, and this is something called quantum mechanical tunneling. And just to give you a demo of that, right, let's imagine I have a barrier here. Here's, that is a barrier, you don't have to imagine it. But let's imagine it's, a, it's like a barrier in a transistor, okay? This is where I'm trying to put the electric, or I'm trying to turn it off, okay? And then I take a particle, like an electron, that's a particle, and I throw it at the barrier. I was told to throw this not to hit cameras, so be very careful. <laughs> oh, I did it, okay. <laughs> okay, that was exciting. I threw it at the barrier and it didn't go through the barrier, okay? That was the whole demo, it totally worked. Okay, so, so, so particles don't go through barriers in our experience, okay? But if I have a wave, and I, I couldn't find a wave, so I'm gonna draw you a wave. If I have a wave coming in, here's my wave. My wave comes in, do, 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 Okay, and then it hits this barrier, and as we know from waves, they don't just stop all of a sudden, right? They kind of, they kind of decay down as it goes to the barrier. And then on the other side of the barrier, there's still a little bit of the wave that can continue, though at a smaller amplitude, okay? So a wave, unlike a particle, doesn't just, here, you guys can't see it. <laughs> it's up there too. A wave, unlike a particle, doesn't just stop. 
okay? A wave gets to a barrier, and then it starts decaying, but if it hasn't decayed to zero by the time it's through the barrier, then it's through. And you have a little bit of that, a wave, of that wave going through. And so an electron starts on one side, its energy goes down as it goes to the barrier, but then you still have a low energy electron on the other side of the barrier. And that's a pure quantum mechanical effect. There's no classical way of understanding things going through barriers where they don't officially have enough energy to go through, right? Classically, this particle can never get through this barrier. But if I think about it as a wave that has some amplitude and probability of extending, then it makes sense that it can extend on the other side of the barrier. And that's a process that we call tunneling because it doesn't go over the barrier, it goes through the barrier, like through a tunnel in a mountain. And you can see the picture here. This typically works for, for thin barriers, right? If it's, if it's a thick enough barrier, then the wave will collapse to zero inside. You'll see almost nothing on the other side. But if it's a thin enough barrier, it can continue through, and you still get some wave on the other side. And so that's why we have this fundamental limit to shrinking electronics, because quantum mechanical tunneling allows these electrons, a the current, to flow through even when we don't have a voltage. So you can't turn it off at low power because we have this very thin region of, of off, of, of insulating, and you can't put it at really high power because you end up overheating it. And so at this point, we're really stuck in terms of how much more we can scale electronics down because at some point, no matter how small we make them, we can't turn them off, right? And if you can't turn off a bit, then it's not a bit, it's a on. <laughs> and that's not, you can't do lots of calculations with on alone. Okay, so what are the current ideas to fix the problem? The semiconductor industry works really, really, really hard. This is a trillion dollar industry. I don't know, lots of money there, right? They really care about making things smaller. The people who research there are very, very clever. Many of my students go on to work in the semiconducting industry. And they do lots of clever things. Like, um, you know, they, from years ago, they figured out that they had a small transistor, but if they made if they added some strain, like they bent it and changed the materials, the electrons were the electrons had had higher um, could move could move more efficiently through the system, which means that you get more current for for the same amount of power. Basically, you can make it smaller. Uh, hold on, there's a yes. They, they, there, there is a sort of quantum computer. I'll mention that at the very end, but yes, but it, but that's. But it's okay. There, there is a sort of quantum computer that's un, that's not clear. That's a quantum computer. People are working very hard at that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so is, are we talking about investment opportunities or pulling stuff out now, or are we talking like? <laughs> so I don't, okay. So you know, my I don't know. I mean, my my guess is you know, right now we're at a 14 nanometer transistor. Um, you know, typically, you know, when you get below five nanometers, it's really hard to be more and more clever about it. So my guess is when you get down to the five and below nanometer scale, they'll have to, they'll have, so they can no longer scale down existing technologies. But this is the point of, of this plot here is that what we're trying to do is figure out new technologies that allow us to stay on Moore's law that don't involve just scaling things down, but rather using different materials or different techniques to increase computing power and reduce sizes without just making transistors smaller. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, what what has been the what's been the barrier so far to, to making small things? And and it's been a combination of things. So one, like I said, one has been power requirements in in transistors. So how much power do you need to turn something off, right? And so they've they've done things like like here, like increase. It turns out increasing strain allows you to turn things off with less power, and so that allows them to make thinner thinner bar thinner barriers, right? Because they need less power, so there's less probability of tunneling. So that's one way they've done it. Another thing they've done is actually change the, the um, insulating material between the, you know, between the gate and the current. And so that's one thing that you can put, you can put a, um, you can turn it off more effectively. Um, you can, but you can put a very thin off region, 
if you have a material that it's harder for electrons to go through. And so there's been a lot of research in trying to change these materials. That's another answer to your question. So if you just did the same thing as you were doing for years and years, which is this talk 30 years ago, then you've reached the limits. And then they had to really turn very hard to material science and physics and other areas of, of, of science and engineering to figure out how do we change the materials themselves? How do we use different materials and combinations of them? How do we use tricks to get these smaller? So you can see, you know, just 10 years ago, they already, they, they, the whole, I mean, you can think of every fab across the country that's making these computer chips suddenly changes materials. This is an enormous investment, right? These are billions of dollars invested in changing these things, but then it allows them to continue to make things smaller. So they change the insulating material. Now they're actually making, you know, different sorts of devices with fins that allow them to cool more effectively. But as I mentioned, at some point, as you get down to the five nanometer scale or below, there's not much, there's nothing more you can really do in terms of materials because you just get very strong tunnels. Right? There's no, any, even, a vac any, even a vacuum barrier, any insulating barrier isn't going to be good enough. And so that's the stage where we really need things like new materials, right? Very small materials that are pre-existing small, like carbon nanotubes, nanowires, graphene, that are already at the atomic scale um, that could possibly make different types of transistors that don't require this, that, that either use tunneling or can bypass the tunneling problem. Okay, and so that's what I want to, uh, to talk about for a little while now is, is what sort of research are we doing now on these new materials in order to make different types of nanoelectronics and transistors and to move technology and research forward. So we need new nanomaterials having better properties, things that are small, that have low power dissipation, that have novel effects, and, and these are the sort of things that are being focused on these days because they're really intrinsically small. And so just to give an example of this, I'm going to talk about graphene, okay? So graphene is a single atomic layer of carbon that's really thin. You can't get thinner than one atom, okay? And it's actually really amazing that, that it even exists because, you know, you'd think that one atom in a sheet isn't stable out in, in nature and air, and it actually, it actually is. And so this was discovered, um, that's the next slide, this was discovered, you know, just 10 years ago that this existed, and it was discovered in really the most, the most, uh, it's probably the simplest way you can imagine is that, you know, graphene is a single sheet of graphite. Graphite we know from things like pencils. And if you just, if you, just uh, you know, take graphite and, you know, write with it or something, you see that it's actually these layers. And then if you take something like scotch tape and peel away layers, you can actually get down to single sheets of carbon on, on a tabletop. Okay. And actually we can make, we can try to make some graphene here. Uh, Okay, so what do I have here? Oh, this is off. Okay, so what I have here is a, is a graphite pencil and paper, and uh, I'm going to make some graphene. Okay, you can see that here, but you're going to make graphene. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm just exfoliating. Okay, so I'm making lots of different thicknesses of graphene by just exfoliating off of a pencil, which is graphite. And you can see that if I then take this and connect it to an electrode, like yay, so here's an electrode on one side, hopefully this works, an electrode on the other side, and I'm gonna turn off the lights because you can barely see it, but if I flip, you can see it now, if I flip the switch, you can barely see the light up. So now if I flip the switch on my graphite circuit, see that light go on? <laughs> <laughs> it's not extremely conducting at this scale, but it does conduct. And so we've now made our own graphene circuit. And if we had done this 10 years ago, we would have won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and, I know. And in fact, this was probably, you know, this is the, uh, this was the, this was the lowest tech Nobel Prize ever. So they literally just, you know, they use scotch tape. If you'd only known you could use your kitchen and art table, you know, objects to win Nobel Prize, we'd all just, you know, we'd be there all the time elbowing out the kids with both the snap circuits and the pencils. Um, but, you know, we can, we could, so, you know, keep doing that. That's a good thing to do. Okay, so, so graphene uh, was, uh, was discovered around 2000. Seven, I believe, or no, 2005, um, single layers. It got a Nobel Prize in, in 2010. 
Um, and, uh, and it has all sorts of amazing properties. It's ultra thin, it's strong, it can carry high currents, and so it has lots of applications to things like transparent electrodes, solar cells, and there's a lot of basic physics of trying to understand what happens in, in 2D materials, how is quantum mechanics relevant, can we make novel sorts of devices? Um, and if you just take a typical graphene device, so again, this is what we do in research, we take some new material like this, and we put electrodes on it and measure its resistance. This is what we started with, right? So now this is already a nanoelectronics experiment because we take something really thin, nano scale, and measure its resistance, okay? And when you make even this sort of simple device, it turns out to be a super fast transistor. Okay, this is published in, in Science. There are papers um, in 2010 and 2012. And you can see it's a very similar sort of device. They just put electrodes on graphene and saw that it didn't dissipate a lot of power. It was a super fast 100 gigahertz transistor, which might be really useful for its really high frequency applications at the nanoscale. Okay? Um, and here's another example of a, of a, of a schematic of a, of, a, of a graphene type transistor. So, so already using these sort of new nanomaterials gives you different capabilities than you have than just scaling down, you know, typical silicon um, transistors. Now, there's an, a caveat with all new materials. Graphene turns out to be really nanoscale only in the vertical direction, whereas it's not nanoscale laterally. And so it's really most useful for layering applications or using its special properties um, for things like high-frequency electronics and mechanical stability. And there's still a lot of research that needs to be done in, in making better materials that are defect-free and are easily transferred. Now, the one thing I want to mention about graphene that we've looked about a lot in our lab is it turns out to be really useful for making flexible electronics, right? And why do we care about flexible electronics, small flexible things? Because they can interface better with us, right? We are not, you know, we're not like metal. We don't walk around like that, right? You know, we actually need something that interfaces well with our bodies if we want, you know, if you can have, you know, right now we have watches and things that, that can go on us, but they're still pretty rigid, right? So we can have wearable electronics that are integrated with our clothing. We can have sensors that can go on our skin and monitor us. We can have things that go inside our bodies and can interface with our cells and can move around while we do that. And so we need materials that can allow us to do that, but it's really hard because most materials are, are rigid. They're not flexible, right? So many, many, many electronic materials like metals and semiconductors are metal, right? And metal's not very flexible, right? So how could I make metal more flexible? What's the theme of this whole talk? Oh, <laughs> I, can, I, can, I, can, I can make it thinner, right? I can nanoscale it. So, so I take this and I make it thin and suddenly it's very flexible, right? I can just make, when you make things nanoscale, they go from being rigid to being bendable and integrating with you better, right? But you have to be careful because, you know, I mean, it, you know, if we're used to this, you can have, you know, this is a metal that's very flexible, right? So, so what you want is something that can, you can make it, this, is, this is, has too many electrons to make a transistor out of, but if you could do this with graphene, you can make large, you can make flexible nanoscale transistors just out of this sort of material. But you do want to be careful, because if I make just normal metals too thin, right, then they break, okay? So you want something that's thin and strong and flexible. Um, and that's what we have with, with, with graphene, okay? So make them thin. So it's highly conducting, ultra thin, ultra strong, flexible, and transparent. Transparency slide. And you can understand the transparency just because it's, it's thin, right? If you take a stack of transparency slides or something, you can't see through it, but one of them you can see through. Okay, so this is sort of the niche area for graphene. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And this, is, and, this is, and, and this is great because people will tell you things all the time, like graphene's really strong, but you know from experience that pencil lead snaps and slides and all sorts of things. So it turns out that graphene is really strong per unit area, right, for its size. And so if you take a small piece of graphene, like a micrometer of graphene, and try to break it, it it's much, much harder to break that micrometer of graphene than it is breaking any other material at that scale if that makes sense, right? So if I took a sheet of graphene and made it really big, it's still only one atom thick. And so I'm not gonna like make a bridge out of a one atom thick thing, right? But, and if I make you know, many stacks of it, it turns into graphite. And so that's also not very thick, very, very strong. But if I make a nanoscale object that needs to be very strong, let's say a tiny little sensor or an integrated bank of sensors and transistors made of graphene and want them to bend without breaking, then it's very strong compared to other materials. And so you have to think about the strength 
per unit size and thickness. Does that make sense? All right. Yes. That's right. Or brittle, or it's snap, right? So things can be, either be, 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 be weak, or if you bend them, they just snap all the times, or stretch, and don't come back to where they are. As you, graphene can be heated, so you actually make it. You can make it in a, a, a by, it, it's, it's kind of like carbon soot. And so you can heat it to 1,000 degrees and nothing happens. You make it by growing it at 1,000 degrees. So it's very robust at high temperatures. Now, if you, if you heat it too much because it's carbon soot, it'll just turn into more soot if you, if you bake it at you know, many, many thousands of degrees. But it's stable up to pretty high temperatures. As you cool it, it's also very robust. So in our lab, we cool it to um, you know, thousands of degrees above absolute zero. And, and then it just gets really interesting electronically, but it doesn't change its properties very much. Superconductivity. Um, this, this is not, but we do a lot of that in my lab, and I could tell you about that another time, but this one does not happen to be. Okay, so these are, these are great questions. So you have to, you know, in all, anytime anyone tells you something that something's really the best in, in some era, you have to figure out, you know, it, it's usually the best for a particular application or in some context. In this case, graphene is the best for highly flexible, transparent electronics at the nanoscale, right? It's really unique material at the nanoscale. And I see I'm running out of time, so I just want to briefly touch on a couple things that we do in my lab looking at bendable graphene because, you know, I do fundamental physics where I care about these applications, but before making devices out of bendable graphene, I really want to know how does electronics change when you bend it? As you bend something and measure its resistance, what happens in this case? And so in my lab, we've spent a lot of time trying to bend graphene in different ways and measure how it conducts electricity. Um, and, and there's a lot of motivation for doing this. You can show that you can get, if you bend it you know, at small scales, you get effective huge magnetic fields, for example, fields that, that would blow up in a laboratory if you just made it. So all sorts of interesting things are supposed to happen as you bend it. And so we've spent you know, some number of years just trying to bend this and measure its resistance. Um, here's, this, is, this was like my you know, tabletop it didn't win a Nobel Prize, but it was a very simple experiment where, where, we just, where we just put graphene on a piece of rubber and then we stretched it. So that thing's about two inches long. And one of my, gra one of my undergraduates built this and, uh, and then put graphene on it, stretched it, and measured its resistance. And, uh, and actually what happened is we just created cracks in the graphene. And so this is, these are sort of, this is uh, maybe a micrometer across here. But you can see as we stretched it, we got a crack and we closed it and the crack closed, and we stretched it more, we got more cracks. And so, and you can see the resistance increasing and decreasing as you open and close the cracks. And so that's not that interesting, but at least um, we did it and it was fun. And you can see, and, and you can see the cracks open and close and it can, you know, so, but so this is one of the things you wanna know if you're gonna make devices out of it, what happens if it cracks, right? Does it totally change the electronics? Is it still robust? And in this case, we found out that it is pretty robust, even if it's cracking, right? Um, we then put graphene on top of substrates where we nano-patterned them. Again, this is a 25 micron scale. So we made nano-patterns, put graphene on top, where we want to strain it locally. As, as the graphene drapes across, it bends in a controlled way. We can control its electronics that way. Um, and we could see, if you look at these are images of what happens at the surface, and you could see that for far apart pyramids, the graphene just conforms to the surface, and as you get them closer together, it starts de-adhering because of strain, so you can control the strain that way. Um, and uh, and then we then we made nanoscale things. So as you can see, these are these are these are you know 100 to 20 nanometer pyramids. We then put the graphene on top of that. This is graphene. We you can we image it with the holes. So you can see where it's pinned on top of the holes here. Okay, so we, we like making a lot of devices in my lab. Right? So you can see. So so we just put the graphene on top of on top of these pyramids where we hope we got strain at the apex of each of these pyramids, and. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about what we measured, but here we just scattered light. We hit, we hit the graphene with light and looked at how it reflected off. And depending on how the light reflects, it tells you about how much it's strained. You get different shifts in the frequency of light when it's strained versus when it's not strained, if that makes sense. Um, and so you can see these blurbs, tell, these little things tell you that when it's, when it's not strained, you get one frequency of light. And when it is strained, you get another frequency of light, which shows that we are straining it just by getting it to adhere to the top of these pyramids. And then we measure its electrical resistance, and we get regions of low, of, low, of low conductance and of high conductance. The low conductance correspond to where the graphene, where the electrons are trapped between these pyramid areas. Okay. So this is the sort of the measurements that we do just fundamentally. How do, we, how do we strain these material? What are their basic properties? How do we understand them? Um, 
I, I won't get into this, but this is, we do it. We, we have lots of different ways of putting graphene on different things and measuring conductance and strain on nanoparticles and how the behavior changes. So, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of possibilities for using, for making new devices, making new transistors, using different sorts of nanomaterials. These are just things I pulled off the web last night. <laughs> this is, you know, this is a germanium nanowire. So this is, this is what, you know, what are people thinking of for next, next generation transistors and electronic devices for making them smaller? What are the new things you can do? Here's a, here's a nanowire transistor where um, it's just a small nanowire. So instead of having gates and oxides, you just have a really thin region um, that acts like a transistor. Uh, this, this came out, this had a headline saying that the, uh, one, the smallest ever one nanometer transistor was made. Okay, so this is another 2D layered material called molybdenum disulfide, and they put that on a, on, a, on a substrate and then put a one nanometer carbon nanotube underneath it and use this nanotube as an on-off control for this 2D material, and they could control the transistor effect that way. And so that's an example of how you use these, layer, these very small nanomaterials in ways to get new next generation transistors that don't require just scaling down existing technologies. Um, you can also do it with things like metal nanoparticles. So these are really active areas of research. There's a lot of fun things um, to do, to study at least, in terms of trying to get smaller devices that have interesting behaviors. Okay, so last two slides. I just want to touch on, on the last thing I said I'd mentioned, which is that you know, we've been talking about using existing technology, scaling things down, making them smaller, um, and how quantum mechanics is limiting our ability to, to make smaller transistors. But on the other hand, you can ask, okay, these things that are very small show quantum properties because they have these wave-like natures. Can we actually use these quantum properties for anything? You know, can we improve computing beyond just scaling down? And this is a question that the young man there asked me before, and the answer is yes, we can do that by making what we call quantum computers. Okay? So, so quantum computers use the quantum, so many quantums, use quantum properties of quantum bits, I'm gonna explain what I mean here. We call these qubits to perform operations more rapidly than a classical computer. Okay. So as an example of that, let's just take two electrons. Okay. And electrons have a quantum mechanical property called spin. We mark this as up and down. You don't even need to worry about that. Just say that there's two properties and there's a one and a zero. So you just need two things to make a bit, right? A bit is on or off, up or down, left or right. Any two things can make a bit because you just have to be able to do, to, to associate numbers with these things and then to store them in some order. Okay. So in this case, we have an up, and a down, and this makes a bit, right? And then we put a set of bits together. We have a binary code, right, a zero, one, zero, one. We already know this as a five, for example, just in binary code, that's standard classical computing. But what a quantum computer does is instead of just having bits that can only be up or down, they can actually be in a superposition of up and down, right? So you can have the same number of particles, but now because you can have something that's both up and down, the same number of particles can have many more states than just being up and down, if that makes sense, okay? So this one can be, instead of just having this as, you know, one, you know, a five, it can be a four plus a five. It can be a four, or it can be a five, or it can be a four plus five, or it can be a four plus five in some fractional ratio. And so by having these different states that it can be in, you can do many more calculations. And so the, what it really is doing is we talked about you know, quantum mechanics is, 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 it tells you that things have wave properties. And when I talk about something being in a superposition of up and down, what I really mean is its wave property is superimposed. You have a four and a five superimposed on each other. Now, you can see that in this, this last demo here of a wave. I get this. So, so this is a wave, okay? And, and when we talk about superimposing waves, what I mean is I've, if I have one wave, it just has like up-down properties, right? And then I can take another wave and put it on top, superimpose this, and now you can see that these waves add together. So I can get the waves adding, right, constructively, or at some places they actually cancel each other out. So by adding two waves together, I can get really different states than just by having one wave alone. And it's not just one state. You can see there's lots of different types of waves I can get by adding two waves together. And so when we talk about superposition, we're talking about adding two waves and then getting all these different states out of it, right? And these have the same wavelength, but you can see if I add a different sort of wave to it, it's very clear I get really interesting patterns of all sorts of waves that can appear. 
okay? So I get all these different wave patterns and think of these as all these different superpositions of states. And that's what quantum computing does. Instead of just having you know, one wave and the other wave, it adds them together and gets a huge variety of wave superpositions that you can then use for calculations. Um, and so that's it. So you can do, you know, for as a classical computer would need to use 2n, uh, needs 2n calculations to do something. A quantum computer needs n, and so it needs many fewer states to do calculations. You often can do superpositions of, of qubits, of spin states. Um, there's lots of things you can do with a quantum computer with so many calculations. You can factor large numbers. Um, you can sort databases. Actually, for people who are interested in computer science, one of the things lacking in quantum computing these days is an understanding of what they're useful for. And so computer science actually hasn't come out with a lot of algorithms showing what you can actually do with these things. Because they really, they're really useful for things that, that you need to sort through, right? They're not great for doing single calculations, but really when you're sorting between lots of options. And so it's a challenge not just to make these things, which it is a challenge, but also to figure out what they're good for. Um, and I'm sure, you know, once we get it, it'll happen. And just to end, there's, you know, here's an example of, of a nanowire-based quantum computer pr pr proposal where you have a nanowire and you have these regions where you isolate electrons, and in each of these are a qubit that can be controlled by gates, and they're read out. This is not the only or even the latest quantum computing proposal. I just wanted to show that, that these sort of proposals are actually integrated a lot with a lot of the other nanowires and graphene and nanoscience things we talked about, but really bring it to the next level by really utilizing their quantum properties. Now, unfortunately, this is all the topic for yet another talk, so maybe next time I come, we'll have a whole quantum computing talk. So, summary to end, we talk about nanoelectronics, all these different aspects, and, uh, and uh, maybe someday we'll go beyond Moore's Law in a really interesting and fun way. Thanks very much. Yes, that's, that's an excellent question. The question was, I've described an empirical approach. Um, lots of people are doing theoretical things, and uh, that's because experiments are the most important. And I say that <laughs> as an experimentalist. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> However, some of my colleagues and other people out there are, in fact, theorists. And, and, and a, a huge parts of this are, are theoretically driven. In fact, one of the most prominent quantum computing proposals these days came about because a theorist figured out new properties of materials that could be used for quantum computation. And Microsoft has just invested hundreds of millions of dollars in this technology that was first you know, proposed by theorists and then found experimentally. And so as experimentalists, we work hand in hand with theorists to understand, to get them to predict things and to help analyze. So absolutely. Yeah, so the question is how one, how, how, can, you, can you add other elements to graphene to make, you know, to make it more interesting? So you can often add, in, intercalate, you can add elements to materials and change their properties. And the answer is graphene, it's really hard to add materials into the lattice structure to change its properties. There are chemists who try to do that. But you know, carbon is, you know, carbon's pretty stable as it is. It forms different sorts of structures like diamond and graphite and, and um, uh, you know, other stuff. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but it's, it's already so stable, it's hard to add molecules, in, atoms in between. But you can, it, it bonds a lot to atoms. It's very sensitive to atoms put on top of it. And so if you, can, if you put a layer of atoms on top of graphene, it really changes its properties a lot. That's, but, but it's really hard to add things into it. It's such a stable structure. Yes? Yes? Yeah, yeah, so, so the question is, can you make, because quantum tunneling has to do the wave properties of electrons, can you make it more like a particle and less like a wave? Um, and, and the problem is this, that, that the, 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 the wavelength depends on the energy, right? And so if we have electrons conducting through a material, they have to be in some energy range to actually get them to conduct, right? And so, a lot, yeah, so because we want a current of a certain value that we can use and measure, and because we have to apply some value of a, of a voltage through a material to turn it on and off, 
then we're, we're limited in the energy range of electrons, which then limits their wavelength. And so it's a great question. Can we make it, can we change its wavelength? And you know, so we could do that by either making it um, slower, right, which you can't, you can only, you know, at some point, it's not driving a current, or by making it bigger, which you can't do with an electron. So, but it's a, it's a good question. I mean, maybe, I mean, it may be possible to conduct other particles, but you really, you want good currents through devices too. So there's a, there's a balance. It's a great question. Yes. 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 Right. Right. So the question is that there are existing algorithms that use quantum computers to, to, to solve problems. Like there's something called Shor's algorithm, which allows quantum computers to factor large numbers. And this is, what, this is why people in cryptography care about it, because our cryptography is based on factoring large numbers, and a quantum computer could then factor any large number, and so we couldn't use our standard cryptography. So the question is, can we use this to solve other sorts of problems that are really hard to solve that are computationally difficult, like in string theory? Or for me, I think about the weather. Right? right now, we can't predict what the weather is because it's too complicated a problem. So if we had a really powerful computer, could we predict the weather more than you know, two days out or something like that, which would be really, really helpful? Um, and the answer is possibly, but right now, those algorithms don't exist. And that, that's one of the problems, that, that right now, um, because, com because quantum computers use these superpositions of states, what they're really good at is sort of testing whether different solutions work. So you, try, you, you get one state and then you test whether that works, you get another state, you test whether that works, and it can do that very rapidly. So if you have an understanding of what you're trying to do already, it works, but if you're trying to find an unknown solution, it's harder right now to use it. And so people are still trying to figure that out. And so that's a great thing for future generations to work on. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I showed an integrated circuit at some point. Yeah, so the question is, are transistors laid? And this is, this is something I didn't mention about how they make transistors. There's actually, they're not, they're not just flat things. There's something called the integrated circuit, um, which, was, which was also a separate Nobel Prize and, and very well deserved at that computer. There we go. Um, very well deserved. So, so standard, standard transistors are made. So, so in order to fabricate these on a scale where you can, right, right now, you can make these things for, for I don't know, anyway, how much does a chip cost? Like dollars, I don't know. <laughs> they're, they're really cheap, right? To make, to make something that has billions of transistors at a scale that's incredibly affordable, they have to make it, the processing very easy. And that means a, top, a, a layered processing thing where they actually have patterns and they just make a pattern and then put a material on, then make another pattern, put another material on, make another pattern, put another material on, and they can do this on a, on a wafer scale. And so to do that on a wafer scale, you have to do it in this kind of 3D patterning where they make, they put one thing down, then another thing down, then another thing down. Even the transistors themselves are made that way. They, they put on one material, then another material, then another on top of it, and you can do that across a whole wafer. And that's why you do it from the bottom up like this. So if you ever did move to things like nanowires, you also have to figure out a way of doing that on a large scale that's controllable. And that's one of the biggest drawbacks right now and hardest things. Yeah. I don't know anything about that. No, that, that doesn't sound very scalable to me because I don't know, <laughs> yeah, Kathleen. But but you never know, right? People are so desperate. So so there, like like I said, the things there are things that there are things that both reduce that reduce tunneling and increase mobility of the electrons, and that could be one of those that make the electrons more energetic for the same density, and therefore reduce the energy you need and reduce tunneling effectively. So yes. Uh, yeah, so, so graphene is, intrinsic, is thought to be intrinsically non-magnetic, so there's theory that it has some magnetism along its edges. And so people are studying that a, a lot to see if there are magnetic properties in there. And in a lot of these materials, coupling them to magnets or superconductors is also 
a really interesting thing. And for me personally, that's a whole other side of my, my research. We couple things like graphene to magnets and superconductors and see what they do. So. Yes, yeah, sorry. Interesting, yeah, right. Yeah, so, so graphene is typically C12, which is a standard atomic graphene, but you can make special isotopes by removing neutrons from these things. You can make C13, for example. So you can make graphene as C13, and that's been done. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to change its properties very significantly, um, and it's expensive, and so people don't do that all the time. But, but you, can, you can make it out of a different, a different isotope, absolutely. Yeah, because at the end of the day, the electrons are doing the bonding, and so it, doesn't, it changes some properties, but not significantly. If you buy a computer, no. So, if you, it's, so the question is, if you buy a computer today, is it full of graphene? And the answer is, is no, because it's, it's, it's so expensive to change the technology that it has to be orders. Any new technology to kick out silicon has to be orders better than silicon is now. And so it's much, much less expensive for the industry to keep trying to do the same things with tricks than it is to invent something completely new, which means they'd have to scrap all their existing plants. And so right now, it's still silicon, but I'm guessing within the next 20 years, they'll have to switch to something else. <laughs> 